we had been texting and talking about AI, a topic that he has covered on his podcast multiple times, a relatively new genre, vertical, whatever you want to call it. I was going to wait until after the NBA playoffs so we could do like a big ass AI episode, you and I. And we can't wait any longer. This is this is happening so fast. It is anecdotally in so many different conversations I'm having with different people in different walks of life, like sports, music, culture, Spotify. Um, this is a tsunami right now. And the only thing I can even compare it to, Derek, is in the mid-90s when the internet went from, oh, what's this? To, wait, you're not on email? And then all of a sudden it felt like everything shifted in 1996 and 97. It feels like this is happening right now in May, 2023. Something is happening, something is different, and this is the dominant topic. Your thoughts? I want to hear all of the gossip morsels that you have for me from music and sports and all of these domains. But I think it's really useful to start with like a brief bit of history here. I think it was like one year ago that you and I had a conversation about the next era of tech. Because as you noted, tech seemed to be kind of exhausted with itself, right? Crypto was in the toilet. Metaverse was like in some whatever septic tank below the toilet. Social media, which was supposed to be the future, all these companies were struggling in their own way. Meta had had an awful year. Snap, TikTok was flirting with getting banned. In streaming, Netflix had lured the entire entertainment industry into what they said was this green pasture of digital streaming. Everyone follows them onto the green pasture and then Netflix is, is like, oh, never mind. actually, it's, uh, it's sinking sand. Uh, enjoy being fucked. And everyone's like, okay, where does tech go from here? Where is the green light? And I said AI. Not because I had some crystal ball in my hands, but because I was like, nothing else seems to be growing. But there's this technology, again, this is the middle of last year, this technology called GPT-3 that was incredibly impressive. And some people are playing around with this large language model and it's producing these weird and incredibly normally human, intelligent seeming paragraphs and prompts. And I thought, you know, this is neat. We'll see where this goes. In the fall after we spoke, the engineers at that company, OpenAI, decided they wanted to basically offer a new skin, a new interface to allow the public to play around with this tool that had mostly just been the domain of nerds. This thing was not supposed to break the internet, Bill. OpenAI did not expect ChatGPT to blow up the world. Microsoft, which was in business with OpenAI, did not expect it to blow up the world. Other people in the industry that were working with large language models at Meta, at Google, the smartest AI people in the world, they didn't think ChatGPT was going to be anything either. And they were all wrong. Everyone was wrong. ChatGPT launches on November 30th last year. Bill, November 30th, that was week 12 of the NFL season. It was 20 right. games into the current NBA season. The Lakers were 7 and 12. Long story short, first 100 days, Chat GPT gets 100 million users. It's the fastest growing consumer application in history. And I tell that brief history and, and emphasize the recency of this technology because when something is growing this fast and when a trend is basically exponential like this, it is essential to make predictions. You have to try to guess where this thing is going to go because you don't know where it's going to be in the next week and it could change your business in six months. But at the same time, whenever something is growing, this quickly, it is so hard for those predictions to be accurate. I can't remember the last thing that has affected basically every single thing I care about, business, sports, culture, um, the, who, everyone I work with, my kids. This is even like, like anecdotally with my kids, just how this has taken over where this is now, it's like, do I do this? The, if I if I feel like other kids are doing this, you're, you're almost like a mid nineties baseball player. I have to take steroids because everyone else is taking steroids. And I just went against somebody who threw 98 miles an hour. There's no way to regulate it. There's no way to police it. And, um, I, I, I don't even know where to start, but let's start here. When this happened with the internet in the mid nineties, there was this one side of like, holy shit, this is so cool. I can't believe we can do this, 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 this. And it just immediately started, you know, interacting with our lives in all these different ways. Then there was the safety scary part of it. And the conversations I've been in the last couple of weeks, the safety scary part 
is the part now people are going, well, wait a second, this is going too fast. What if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? Um, two examples. One, if they can replicate my voice and AI person just trying to cause harm calls my son, but it's not me and says, come meet me at this location. And my son's like, oh yeah, my car broke down, come get me. And my son goes there and whatever. Like, so you have all of that stuff, all the terrible ways that can go. And then the other side is just being able to lift somebody's voice, being able to basically recreate somebody um, to steal music, which has already been happening, to create music and the sounds of people, to create visual stuff, that actors that could look like, like there's all these things and we know how this goes. Nobody's gonna be able to regulate this forever. Now, when this happened with the internet in the mid nineties, we all panicked, we freaked out. Oh my God, I'm, I'll never put my credit card online. S most of it turned out fine. There was still some really bad stuff, right? And that took a while and then we're still kind of unpacking the bad stuff. But we were kind of a little too panicky about it. Is there reason to be even more panicky about this AI stuff in your opinion? These are really, really good questions. Okay, so the way that I try to force myself to talk about this subject is that I try to stay out of the future tense until I have to jump into it. Because it's so easy to say, oh, this kind of thing is gonna be possible and it's gonna happen. You know, this kind of thing is gonna be possible and it's gonna happen. But you wanna remind yourself, wait, what's happening right now? How are people using this technology right now? What is What are the news headlines of the day, not the predictions people are making in the future? So I wrote this article for The Atlantic that I sort of cheekily called, AI is a waste of time. And what I meant by that isn't that AI is just a waste of time. It's that when I reflect on my own use of ChatGPT, and when I reflect my own use of Midjourney, which is a text to image AI prompt, uh, you know, you can say, you know, I want to see Derek in the style of, you know, Van Gogh on Mars with a cowboy hat. It can make some really incredible photorealistic images. When I reflected on how I'm using these technologies, I thought I'm actually not using them to be more productive all the time. I'm using them to waste time, to sort of test the technology, right. to sort of see what it can do. And so as productivity enhancing as all this technology might eventually be for many different industries. Right now, I think it's probably productivity sapping for a lot of industries because people are just playing around with it to see where it goes. Now, maybe that'll flip. Maybe the games people are playing now will be the work that people do of the future. But right now, I think a lot of people are just testing this thing to see what is possible. And it's important to say before we predict that this is going to change everything, which by the way, I think is possible. We don't have a number one hit TV show written by AI. We don't have a number one song written by AI. We don't have an epidemic of Bill Simmons style media celebrities having their voices stolen by AI arsons and spammed to place bogus calls to their families to create scenarios that become catastrophic. That, that kind of stuff isn't happening yet. Of course it doesn't mean it can't happen in the future, but, but it's not happening yet. So you wanna look at everything that's happening now and say, how are people actually using this? Fundamentally, I see in a lot of cases, yes, computer programmers are doing it to accelerate their work. Yes, people in Hollywood are using it to see if they can write stories, but a lot of people are still in the mode of just plaguing with this. Now, let's go to the future. How could this be used in the future? Well, let's stick to music. And we can, we can go back to the spam thing because that is freaky and plausible. But, but in music, I'm very interested in the legal debates that are happening right now in terms of how these kind of mix and match technologies can be, can be used by consumers. I think what you're going to see is the recording music industry saying, we're going to try to sue AI companies on two fronts. We're gonna to try to sue to keep you from using our music to train your algorithms. And we're gonna to try to keep you from selling music, from making a bunch of money, because you just wrote your own song and plugged in the voice of Drake or plugged in the voice of Bad Bunny. So there's gonna be a lot of really interesting like legal problems with the way AI is used in music. But in the short term, I do think a lot of people are gonna use this to kind of just play around. Just last quick thing. Grimes, the musician who was previously married to Elon Musk, um, came out with an app that allows her fans to make music and then dub in her voice um, in the music that they make. And she said, if you guys release this and make money from it, there's going to be a royalty sharing agreement that we have. So I make a little bit and you make a little bit. Maybe we get a huge Grimes hit, but I wonder whether, again, a lot of people are just going to use this to kind of F around, you know, to like 
uh, send like a message to their friend, but in the voice of Grimes to just kind of be funny. So a lot of things are happening here. And I do think that, that the legal challenges that this is going to pose to the music industry are going to be utterly fascinating. Well, it reminds me a little of when uh, rap started to take off in the 80s, when they just it was like a free for all for sampling old songs. And it wasn't really governed. And it kind of was, but it was it's like, you're going to pay, but nobody was even thinking that way because it was such an early version of the form. And then eventually there was this, wait a second. And we had that wait a second moment. We have that with all these different things. Like the writer strike right now, which is happening. And AI was one of the things that got thrown in. And I don't see any way, like zero, that the studios would go, oh yeah, well, Ben, forget it. We'll get rid of AI because... Let's face it, the studios, you know, they're they're going to be thinking about profits and they're going to be thinking about repeatability and sustainability. They're not giving up on that yet when they don't know what the technology is. And I think that's, depending on how hard the writers fight for that, that's going to be a real sticking point. But when you think about it, and I think this is both scary to me, but also makes sense to me. All right, like Law and Order or um, the Chicago Fire Show. Or, I don't know, pick pick any generic sitcom. There's a formula to all of those. Like you go on Netflix and it's like, oh, there's a new, there's something wrong with the house movie. Oh, there's a couple, they're moving in. Oh, look how cute their kid is. Wait, what's wrong with the attic? AI is going <laughs> to just be able to take like 300 horror movies that have something wrong with the house, right? And AI will be able to write a script and basically create their own version of that. So now I don't need a writer. For same thing for the Dick Wolf universe. Dick Wolf might already be AI. He might not even really exist. He might have been replaced 10 years ago, but it'll just be the same procedural with the same beats. So I think for just starting with art, I think all of a sudden there's these huge stakes already. And if I'm at any of these big companies, what do companies always do? They always try to replace human labor with computers. We saw it happen with phone operators when I was a kid. Like this is kind of where their mind drifts. Oh, I can just get rid of humans and have machines do this? I think this is conceivable. It is absolutely conceivable. This is where I don't think you need too much of an imagination to see that this is basically here. And if it's not literally here, it's gonna happen tomorrow. Like the strikers right now want, as I understand it, a guarantee that the studios aren't going to cut them out of royalty payments by crediting AI tools like ChatGPT when they come up with storylines. But there is just no way that a studio producer or a Netflix executive isn't going to play around with ChatGPT and come upon a story whereby legally they should retain the credit for that story. Like, Well, especially if they own the show, like if they own Law & Order... It's basically they're using the AI instead of the writer. I don't know what the what rights the writers would have. This is like one of the 95 fascinating things about AI right now. It, it really is. So I, I was playing around with this. I, I have GPT-4, which is the advanced version of ChatGPT. And, um, you know, it's really freaking weird. I asked it to essentially write me uh, an episode of Chicago Fire. Maybe that's just like the, the most <laughs> GPT-able television show. And I, right. I just said, quote, write me a story outline for a one-hour TV show in the mode of Dick Wolf about a team of firefighters taking on a blaze that injures one of their own. The plot should include a mystery about who started the fire, two love developments, and two twists, the second of which should come at the end of the episode and set up a shocking season finale. Now look, I don't think that the story outline that I got is A+, but it's not it's not B-. minus. It's like A-, minus B+. Plus. It's, it was a really interesting treatment for 56 minutes of television. And I could absolutely imagine just like giving that printout to a team of writers and saying, this is the new episode. So, that, But that's, you that's can, the key to this. The, they could create the template for whatever the episode is, hand it to the writers, and the AI almost becomes the head writer. Hey guys, that, knock yourself out with this. And that's not even the end of the process, Bill. So there's this idea that some people talk about called sandwiching in writing with AI. And sandwiching means that I prompt AI, I ask a question like, you know, I want to write an article about what 20th century technology, artificial intelligence is like. Give me five examples. It comes back with, you know, nuclear weapons, penicillin, a bunch of other stuff, you know, the internet. Then after that, I can take the material and craft an article, right? 
There are AI apps now that can help people with the second half of that. There's an AI app called Pickaxe, which allows screenwriters essentially to get around writer's block so that they throw in some basic features of a story they want to tell. And Pickaxe suggests various plot lines that they can put into a story. OK, that's pretty good. But Wait, now so, here's so like Jesse Armstrong doing Succession is like, all right, Logan Roy's funeral shit, I don't know what to do with the eulogy scene and just kind of basically feeds all of it to AI. And AI is like, what if you do this? Yeah, right. I've got a story that is like basically loosely based on the Murdoch Empire and King Lear. And I've got a son who's basically Hamlet and I've got a little dipshit called Roman and I've got Shiv. Here's the <laughs> here's the plot lines of how we got to right. the end of this of the series. Give me seven ways the story can end. When, when you learn how to play with it in an advanced way, you can give it more than that. You can say, give of those seven ways that, that this season can end, give me three that are obvious, give me two that are slightly less obvious, and give me two or three more that are really mind-bendy and weird. And you can take all of these and then mix and mash them together and write essentially the treatment of the last you know two episodes of, of Succession. But it get, it's one step further. Again, on the sandwiching side, once you've written that script, you can still plug writing into ChatGPT and say, tell me what you think of this. If I write an essay that's kind of complicated, that's making a bunch of different points, and I don't know that I'm getting the point across, I can take that essay, put it into ChatGPT and say, what point do you think I'm making, computer? And it can tell me, here's what I think your thesis is. And if I think that's wrong, I can go back and say, oh, I have not been clear enough in my writing. So not only can you use ChatGPT in this case, like a research assistant or like a brainstorming assistant, you can also use it like an editor. And that raises all sorts of questions for writers like me. I mean, exactly like me. The Atlantic just published its AI policy a few days ago. It raises a lot of really important ethical questions. AI policy? How do I, yeah. How do we talk about, how do writers like me and other people at The Atlantic talk about their use of AI? Is it just like Google, where I would never disclose that I Googled something when I to research it? Or is it kind of like a person where if I took a paragraph from a book, that's clearly a copyright infringement of the book. That's not honestly fully human. Like there's so many messy questions when the future of artistic and creative work becomes more chimerical. It's not merely human. It's like human plus monster. That's a very, very strange future to be entering. Yeah, so I had a friend, I have a friend who's in a company that invests in different businesses. And he said a lot of the businesses right now, the small startup stuff are all AI based, right? And he was telling me, and this is when I, I ended up calling you a day later because I was like, what's going on with this stuff? He was like, yeah, in like three, four years, there'll be some bot of you that listens to all the podcasts you've done, is able to absorb all of it. Maybe they even look at all the writing you've done. They create some sort of bot version of you. And then somebody after a Celtic game could be like, I'm going to talk to the Bill Simmons bot and see what he thought of the game. And by the way, the bot would probably be exactly where I was after game one against <laughs> Miami, where I'd be like, oh my God, our coach is fucking serious up. Why didn't we call time out in the third quarter? I'm pretty sure the bot would hit all the beats I would hit with my dad coming when we talked uh, the next day. Um, but when he said that, and then I'm thinking, all right, well, that actually makes somewhat, would people rather interact with the bot or listen to my podcast? Do I have control over the bot? And then, you know, because we've had this in movies and TVs. If, you can't just use Al Pacino's voice for a Mazda commercial, right? Right. Al Pacino will sue you. So it just feels like there's going to be all this ethical legal stuff that will be basically the next 10 years. But the history of this stuff is you can get away with what you can get away with before the rules come in. They can't get away with it anymore. It takes forever to make these rules. Do we do we trust the Supreme Court to come up with like a great strategy for this? I certainly don't. Yeah, I'm not a legal expert, so I agree that the legal questions are incredibly thorny and fascinating. But I'm gonna I'm gonna put a pin in that for a second. I want to return to the idea of uh, chat BS, essentially turning you and your voice into the AI. BS because bot. yeah, the B I, I I see no reason why something like BS bot for other media facing celebrities won't be a thing. I mean, it already is a thing for Grimes, the musician, right? She's the first out of the box saying, use my voice. I don't care. Put it in your songs. Let's make music together. We'll share the royalties. Go have fun. Other people are going to do this. And it raises interesting questions of, okay, where is this most useful? So, you know, you do work like you have ad reads. You know, do you have to do all the ad reads? If you sign off on the Bill Simmons bot, reading the Simply Safe ad, 
Well, then maybe that's legal. Well, I love Simply and Safe. I would, totally I would before, always want a human <laughs> touch with Simply Safe. But they're one of our best partners. For Simply no, no, Safe. I'm glad you brought this up because I, I don't think I'm. I don't think Spotify is going to get mad at me for this. Like we're developing that stuff and we're, there mm. is going to be a way to use my voice for the ads. You have to obviously give the approval for the voice, but it opens up from an advertising standpoint, all of these different great possibilities for you could have localized. Let's say we did a thing with like a ticket, ticket resale or something like that. You could geo target that for each city. I, the more interesting thing for me with that is, could you take my podcast? Like, me and House and Jacoby talking about Game 2 Lakers Nuggets, which will be right before this part of the podcast. Could they take that and make AI Spanish version of it? Could they put mm. it in French? Could the AI people, could they take the translations and just quickly take our voices and just make a podcast in 35 languages that reacts to the game? To me, that doesn't, that, this is what's so crazy about AI. That, that actually seems realistic to me. It seems realistic and it's not entirely clear to me that that's dystopian either. Like if you right. and House and Jacoby have all signed contracts to Spotify, essentially saying, I allow my voice to be AI manipulated exclusively for, and House is a lawyer, he'll be, yeah. he'll be able to recite this better than I can, but exclusively for uh, local market translations and for no other purpose. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a wonderful thing. Like there might be people in, you know, the Czech Republic who want to listen to your podcast or vaguely aware who like the Celtics and would listen to a show like this, except for the language barrier. Um, I think that's well, a and then what really, happens, really like, interesting what happens application could, of it. If I get hit by a bus, people are like, man, I really miss Bill's podcast. It's like, no, he's back. <laughs> he's now a bot. <laughs> a zombie Bill now recording on the zombie heat. Yeah, yeah exactly. the zombie Bill Simmons podcast. We'd probably get sponsors <laughs> for it. Presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. There's actually, Bill, this is interesting. So um, the economist Tyler Cowen, uh, who has yeah. a really interesting podcast, did a chat GPT interview with the philosopher and author Jonathan Swift, the author of Gulliver's Travels, who, spoiler alert, is extremely dead. But right. he asked him all these questions. And because... Again, this is a pre-trained technology. It's pre-trained on a corpus of, of literature. And so if you're a dead author who's published a ton of writings, well, the technology is going to be really good at pattern matching and predicting what you're going to say in response to various questions. And so Tyler is talking to a, I think, British or Scottish or Irish, I don't remember like exactly where Jonathan Swift was born, actor reading ChatGPT scripts that are responding to questions the way that this dead author might have responded to questions. I mean, that is actually exactly the kind of zombie relationship that you're describing, except it's zombie Jonathan Swift. You could, I think, imagine all sorts of ways that we could essentially bring back, this is, this is creepy in a way, but we, we could have bizarrely very similar conversations with dead intellectuals, asking them about what, how they would respond to issues of the day. And that is this process of zombification that you're talking about. It's not, it's not their voice, but maybe 50 years from now, when we have a ton of recordings of certain people's voices, we'll be able to do that too. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's good or creepy or a fascinating research project or unbelievably unethical. Like it might in a weird way be all four at the same time, but there's just no question. It is so, so interesting. Just quickly on the, on the art side of things and the zombie part of it. So let's say David Chase wanted to bring back the Sopranos and we had the technology. James Gandolfini passed away, I don't know, 12, 13 years ago. And he has the technology plus all the AI voice stuff where it could be like, I can basically make old Tony Soprano. I can make Tony, Tony Soprano didn't die. Now we're 16 years later, 17 years later, 18 years later, he's an old mobster in New Jersey and here's his life. And I can have an actor playing him. I can do face stuff to make it really seem like it's Gandolfini and I can have the voice saying all the lines. I don't think David Chase would do this, but my point is, I do think in 10 years, we will be able to do stuff like this and some people are going to do it. It's too creepy for me to imagine it being a hit, but it's also, uh, the word that came to my mind is cool. And I'm not sure that cool is, is the perfect word for it, but I'll, I'll run with it anyway. It's cool enough that you know this is a technology that people are going to use. And this is where I want to return to my point about play. If you imagined a democratized, cheap 
readily available technology that could put zombie AI Gandolfini in all sorts of situations, that would replace all sorts of memes in my imagination, right? It would, it would, people would talk to each other um, and right. make Sopranos fanfic media using this technology like for an audience memes. of- yeah, right, exactly. It'd be for an audience of like five though, not an audience of five million. And that's where I think, you know, if to the extent that I'm, I'm like working on a couple of sort of like, you know, big picture ideas about like, where are we going with AI? What does it mean in like the grand sweep of like, you know, the last hundred years of media? And I was having a conversation recently with someone where they said, you know, the 20th century was really an era of mass production. And for a long time, we've been headed for an era of narrow casting. So if you think of the 20th century as like mass production plus broadcast, that is the shows like Cheers are made to be watched by uh, 50 million people and they're broadcast 50 million people. Okay, in the early 21st century, we move to mass production plus narrow cast. So you have art and entertainment that is made for tens of millions of people, but Facebook feeds and Twitter feeds and Instagram feeds and TikTok feeds are all specific. They're all narrow cast for you. So you're yep. getting an individualized slice of mass production. What might happen in the future is that you get individual production plus narrow cast, if that makes sense. So ChatGPT writes just for you. If you prompt ChatGPT to write, you know, a Dick Wolf episode and I prompt it to write a Dick Wolf episode, we will get two different Dick Wolf episodes. But how far does that personalization process go? Could you imagine AI songs written just for you? I like this Taylor Swift song, but do it in the style of you too. Could you imagine video games that change in response to individualized user requests so that in effect, no one is playing the exact same game? That I think is the really spooky, weird promise of AI, that we already understand that we live in a world of fragmentation, right? You used to have Alter, like Uncle Walter Cronkite, and now everyone gets their news from their own podcast and newsletter. How far can AI take that where people can individuate their consumption of media so much that everyone is consuming their own personalized thing on their own narrow cast? That's where I think it gets really weird and interesting. I asked somebody in the music industry, just give me two AI points and here were the two. And this is a person who knows things. He said, authenticity always wins regardless of how this AI thing comes out. And that that's an interesting point just in general that humans are always going to want the humans to win with this stuff, right? So even with art and any of this kind of stuff, I'm always going to want the song that was made by a real human over the song that was made you know, by a robot. Cause then all that does is tell us deep down in our souls that, you know, we're all kind of just on a hamster wheel and there's no, nothing special about any of us. We can just be replicated by it. So we're, I feel like the human part of it. Um, and also like from actually being able to perform, which is where like in the music industry, most of the money is really coming now from concerts like this Taylor Swift tour that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. you can't have an AI concert. So that, so there's one, there's a piece of that that's just never going to change. The other thing he said, this is a positive one. Like think of, cause everyone's going to go the negatives. Like we just did for a half hour. It's like, think of the positives. Like how's this going to change healthcare? Mm. What if there is an AI healthcare app that I can just put in my symptoms and it just immediately figures out exactly what I need and gets the medicine and, um, you know, we're all like Google doctors these days, but what if AI can really diagnose, hey, I've noticed these nine things are going on with you right now and that could be this. It's a little like with the stupid watches that we talked about the last time you were on that my wife was going crazy that she only got a 74 sleep, but maybe that maybe <laughs> AI will figure out a better way for us to take care of ourselves. So that's a positive, Derek. Those are two really good examples. Let me try to hit them one by one. So the first thing you said that I absolutely agree with is that people like people. Like <laughs> Thank Taylor God. Swift fans are not fans of the sound of Taylor Swift's music, no matter where it comes from. They are super fans for her. They love her. They have parasocial relationships with her. And I see no evidence. As I said at the top, there is no number one AI TV show. There is no number one AI musician. If that changes, I'm ready to change my hypothesis that people love people. But we, art is about this relationship between 
human fans and human artists because it's not just about the product. Yeah, AI yeah. can write stuff, but people are fans of people. So that's number one. Number two, I I'm really glad that you brought up the science medicine part because I've had a lot of really interesting conversation with scientists um, and doctors about how this technology is being used. And I think the best way to think about it is sort of short-term, medium-term, long-term. So short-term is being used in a lot of prosaic ways. Like so much of being a scientist these days, it's like writing a bibliography and writing like a lit review of some paper that you want to be published in Nature Journal. That takes days sometimes. Now you can do it in minutes, possibly. Mm. And that's really fantastic. That'll change time and hopefully that'll improve science. Medium-term, Bill, you nailed it. It's, it's diagnostics. You know, we already live in a world where if you have a stomach ache, and your, food, and your foot is swollen and you can't see out of your right eye, by the time you go to your doctor, you're going to use your one good eye to Google all those symptoms and come in with a theory. This is what I think I have. You know, it's, I, I think it's gout and he says it's not gout. And then you have a fight about whether or not it's gout. They're going to have better diagnostic tools. And you can so easily imagine that a human doctor plus a high quality diagnostic large language model or a, high, a high quality diagnostic AI is going to be a, um, a, a richer diagnostic experience. The long-term possibilities are what really, really thrill me. Um, let me try to do this quickly because it's, it's a little bit complicated, but I think it's so interesting. If you think about like what ChatGPT does, ChatGPT maps words in a multidimensional space to understand the relationship between every world, word that exists so that when you prompt it, it can build a kind of map of meaning from all of those words that you understand to be a correct answer. And that is amazing that it can do this. But sometimes I think like, all right, ChatGPT is fluent in the language of English, the language of English, but there are other quote unquote languages that exist that humans might not be fluent in yet. So for example, if you think about like the human body, our cells are talking to each other. Our mRNA is talking to our proteins. Our T cells are talking to diseases. We just don't know what the F they're saying. But biology, anatomy is a language. It's just a language that we humans are not fluent in yet. But two years ago, there was a project at DeepMind called AlphaFold which cracked the mystery of protein folding. You could, say, you could say, essentially, and this is not too metaphorical, that it cracked the language of proteins. And if our bodies essentially are a language that we aren't fluent in, that AI can understand the same way it understands English, then it might be able to have all sorts of breakthroughs about cancer and polygenic disease that we aren't even close to cracking. And that's really like the long-term, faraway, utopian hope is that it is building, we are building a kind of intelligence that will let us go so much further in answering the most important questions of human lifespans and medicine. And I am, I am mildly optimistic that on a long enough time horizon, 10, 15 years, we're going to see miraculous stuff come down the pike from our artificial intelligent understanding of our bodies. Yeah, it made me think of, you did a great podcast a few months ago about dieting mm. and the concept of how have we not cracked the code of dieting? There's all these different diets. Why hasn't one of them won? Where's the, where's the one that's just, this is the way to do it. Like in basketball where they're like, take more three pointers. Everybody's like, yeah, you should take. And then just, but dieting's not like that. And the answer, which I think you, I forget the guess, who is the guest? Oh, we had we had two guests, but we, yeah, we had a we had a guest from from Harvard endocrinologist, and and then we had I had some writers on as well to talk about sort of like meta analyses, and you know one of the upshots well, about go, sorry I was going to say one of the one of the guests but the the basic conclusion was there is no answer. Every person's different, mm -hmm. and the diet is what works for you. It doesn't mean it's going to work for my wife. It doesn't mean it's going to work for my son. Everybody's different. Everything hits something differently, and it makes me think with AI. If AI can figure out a way to basically what each person, what, what they like, what they don't like, what affects them. Cause like yesterday, my son brought, he, my son went and got bagels. He's like, you want a bagel? I never eat bagels. I'm like, you know what? I fucking want a bagel today. Give me a toasted <laughs> onion bagel with cream cheese. I had it. I was in a coma for like two and a half hours. So it was like barely <laughs> functional. It's like, why did I have this bagel? But clearly if I eat a bagel with cream cheese in the middle of the day, I'm just going to suck for until three in the afternoon. My body knows this. If you had a, like basically your AI manager 
and it takes in all the input and I eat every day and I'm like, this made me feel good. I had this, I felt terrible. Ooh, I had truffles yesterday. That was a disaster. And then AI basically scripts out what I should eat every day. Maybe I'm leading a better life. I mean, that, so back to your point of like how some of this stuff might be a lot better. I, I do think that's going to happen. I think it's going to happen too. And, you know, I, I want to reserve the possibility. I think we spent a lot of time on, on the downsides. And obviously there's lots of ways that AI could go wrong. But just a, another vote for optimism here. You could imagine the combination of wearables and AI being really powerful. Because if you've got an Apple Watch or you've got some next generation Apple Watch and you eat a bagel in this AI-inflected future and the Apple Watch has some way of measuring the fact that you are incredibly lethargic or maybe you just tap two buttons to indicate extreme lethargy on your phone, then maybe it, it remembers your history a little bit better and it is it is informing you as you go about your life little things that might make you happier. So I, I know someone working on a stealth project that is... Um, I think he would describe it as her, uh, the technology from the movie Her, but with right. the romance lobotomized out of it. So it can't fall in love with you, but it is still a personal assistant in your ear that can follow you around and talk to you if you want to be talked to by it. And I think that having a kind of extraneous intelligence essentially remember all sorts of things for you that you wouldn't otherwise remember. You're a busy guy. You've got, you've got, you've got, you've got all these jobs. You might not remember, like if I have the, you know, the bagel at 11 yeah. a.m., I'm going to be lethargic until 2 p.m. But if some extraneous intelligence is remembering that for you, I think that could really, really help. Uh, I, I think I, it help a lot of people because there's just so much going on. It's nice to have another macro brain always running alongside you. Well, I was thinking it would have helped Joe Missoula during game one of the Heat series where like, Joe, they can't miss a shot. Call timeout. <laughs> Your team needs the three minutes to think about this. And so in sports, though, couldn't you see this kind of changing? Like we've already seen in sports, we had all this, the data revolution changed the way we played basically every sport in, in some ways for the worse. Like in baseball, I actually think they've had to make these new rules just to kind of undo some of the damage. And I wonder now with AI, could you do this in football? Could you have AI script out? You know, they always say Kyle Shannon, he scripted out his first 15 plays. Maybe AI scripts out like 80 and they script out every scenario. Like you're down 10 to Joe Burrow. It's the third quarter. Here are the six plays you should run so you can have a long drive. I think all that stuff's coming too. I don't think that's crazy. With Joe Mazzulla, he needs the equivalent of Apple Watch's reminder to stand. Just like every hour, it buzzes your wrist <laughs> and, and says, yeah, maybe you should stand. Right, exactly. Yeah, you, you, your team is down 17 points this quarter. Like maybe you should yeah. call your timeout. When it comes to sports, I the reason I am a little bit less optimistic is that I, I wrote this piece about what I call the dark side of Moneyball, which is that lots of entertainment industries, as they get smarter, their products get, quote unquote, dumber or at least less interesting. So as baseball got smarter, you had an increase in strikeouts, an increase in walks, and an increase in singles. You had an increase in all the, and, excuse me, and, and, um, and home runs. You had an increase in all the, the three true outcomes, and there were fewer base runners, essentially, than ever. In basketball, I think you've seen, I think it's fair to say that, although I, I've loved the playoffs, you've seen an, an homogenization of styles. There's a huge, broad understanding that yep. three points is worth more than two points, and teams should shoot more threes. You could argue you've seen the same in Hollywood. Like, look at the top 10 movies of every year this century. It is all movies with numbers in them. Gardens of the Galaxy 3, adaptations, sequels, and reboots. If everyone's essentially drawing from the same large language model to decide, should I pass in the situation? Should I run? Should I go for fourth down? It might lead to everyone essentially doing the equivalent of, you know, taking a, a three 40% of the game. Was that a speech for Daryl Morey to maybe mix it up with the Sixers? Felt, it, felt, it felt veiled. It felt like you were calling him out a tiny bit. It, it no, is, I'm with is you. Not veiled at all. I think, you know, Daryl said that he's in favor. Uh, I, I don't know how sincere this is, but he's in favor of making uh, the three point line worth 2.5 points in order to change his strategy, right? Even he is saying the finite strategies that people like me are pursuing are leading to an infinite strategy that's making the game a little bit more homogenous and boring. And maybe one way to, if you want to fix it, don't tell me, Daryl, to fix it, fix the rule. And then, right. you know, then the Sloan nerds of the world will change their strategies based on the new rule. Well, basketball is a good example. Just get get rid of the actual corner three, mm -hmm. make that two, and, you know, it would go. I think uh, the last piece, we didn't talk about this. The sports will be, you know, it, 
not hard to figure out. The last piece we didn't talk about was the safety security piece. And, you know, everybody's mind when they hear about AI goes to, well, what happens when AI overrides something and all of a sudden people are bombing each other and we all die? Um, that I do not have answers on, Derek Thompson. I don't know. Um, he's certainly been the plot of a lot of movies over the years, including War Games, which came out 40 years ago. Um, but uh, that one I'm a little more dubious on. And that seems like that's going to have to involve coordination between countries and world leaders and things that generally the world hasn't been great at these days. So how does that play out? Well, this is, thank you for uh, the alley-oop. This was the last episode of Plain English. The, yes. It's called The Future of War is Here. And we talked to the CEO of Andural, who is, which is the company that makes probably more drones and sells more drones to the US government than any other. And I talked to my friend Ross Anderson, a writer in The Atlantic, about his recent work on AI. I'd summarize it very quickly this way. I'm not against using AI to replace troops, but we should not use AI to replace generals. I don't want AI making decisions about who to invade. I don't want AI making decisions about command and control of nuclear weapons. But I'm not against a future where fewer of our soldiers are in the field. And I'm not against a future where we outline the borders of certain nervous countries like Ukraine with drones that make it less likely that a Russia invades. I think there are ways to use AI responsibly to reduce the likelihood of war rather than merely increase the likelihood of some kind of atomic catastrophe. But that said, and you mentioned this, this has to be done so carefully. And like nuclear weapons, this is not something where if the US comes up with its own rules, then our rules work for the entire world. No, China's gonna have its own rules and Russia's gonna develop its own chat GPTs and so is Pakistan and Brazil. All these countries are going to eventually have these tools. And we need something like a Montreal Protocol or United Nations to bring countries together, even if they're geopolitical adversaries, and say, can we find some way that we reduce the likelihood of automated apocalypse? Do you think fake me and fake you are talking in 10, 10 years about how AI is doing in 2033? I think, th I think we are, but I don't think anyone's listening. That's that's the thing that's really hard to overcome is that you yeah. know, making a little making a making a you know chat bill that you tell a joke to your friend if you both listen to the Simmons podcast for years and years that's that's funny but that's an audience of two making making robot making zombie bill for an audience of two million that's so much harder and very unlikely because people listen to you because they want to know what you actually think not what a robot that plausibly sounds and plausibly thinks like you. Thanks. You know, I was thinking, I was trying to think how would how would uh, AI help me the most just week to week, right? What one thing would it help the most? And I was thinking it would help the most with the rewatchables prep because mm. the rewatchables, it's basically a script. I have all these categories. So I'll do all the research and I'll put the stuff in the different categories. Then I'll watch the movie and I'll put different observations in there. And technically, AI could figure out exactly what the script is. They could examine the movie, put the things in and just lay it out for me and save me three to four hours of, of work even before I watch the movie. The problem is the podcast wouldn't be as good because I wouldn't be coming up with these different ideas and thoughts as I'm doing the research. And, oh, I, I see this and I'm like, oh, that makes me think of this. I don't see how AI is ever going to replicate that. Um, and... Maybe it could lay out a kind of a basic script of, oh, here are all the, the, the like half fast internet research we do on that. For the most part, it still needs like my brain to kind of, you know, be the chef. And I, I'm sure you're in the same, same thing with some of the pieces you're working on. Like you could have AI, like basically lay the foundation, but then you're not thinking about it as you're writing about it. And it's just not going to be as good. I totally agree. Uh, I found it most useful at two things. And the first, I can't think of its relevance to the rewatchables. It's pretty good at coming up with history stories. If, right. you're, if you're writing a book, let's say a book of basketball, and you say, I want, I'm looking for seven stories from basketball history that show that undrafted or um, overlooked players can be incredibly important in NBA finals. Give me seven examples of an un, of a of a poorly evaluated player in the draft becoming a hero in the NBA Finals. 
in my experience, it's pretty good at doing that. And yeah. it's not, it's, it's not, you can obviously see how that could be useful when you're writing a book and you're making a point about this idea that sometimes it's random Jason Terry's that end up swinging a series, right? J.J. Boreas. Um, the other way I found it's really useful is if you have a theory and you put in a chat GPT and you can say, tell me I'm wrong. Give me reasons why this is wrong. So you could say, give me reasons why um, I'm wrong in assuming that it's good to call a timeout when your team uh, is on the back end of a 20 to two run. Um, tell me why I'm wrong in saying uh, that every movie uh, with Leo might be made a little bit better uh, with Matt Damon. Like, tell me why certain theories of mine about entertainment and sports and history and technology, tell me why I'm wrong. I found it's actually really useful at doing that. Mm. And there again, you're not using it to write. You're using it to test the quality of your theory. And maybe you'll build on it. Maybe you'll say, oh, maybe I can incorporate a little bit of this into my work. But it's allowing you to do the thing that good writers should already be doing anyway. But it's frankly very hard when you're crafting a piece, which is constantly imagining this shadow ledger of arguments that is screaming at your article and telling you why every single thing you're saying is wrong. This sort of tell me why I'm wrong, magical daemon that you can have like sitting alongside you as you're writing, I found to be pretty useful. Jesus, sounds better than pot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, shit, there was one more piece. Oh, we didn't talk about the financial aspects of this, just that could, could like hedge funds in different places put basically the history of the stock market into AI and have AI spit back the ebbs and flows of like, oh, this has now happened for nine months. That means that this is getting too good. That means we can expect some sort of bad thing to all of a sudden this will happen. And just because regardless of what's happening in society, the stock market does have a certain rhythm to it. Could AI like learn that rhythm? Theoretically, yes. And I have no doubt that wealth managers and investors and iBanks all over the world are going to try to build their own models. But I think of this as like, you know, trading is an equilibrium. There's a, there's a buyer for every seller and a seller for every buyer. And if all the institutions are going to essentially build their own language models that are yeah. looking at the same data, that are looking at the exact same history of the S&P 500 to make predictions about the next six months of the S&P 500, then it might all just wash out. Um, I've seen no evidence that AI is so much better at prediction in the long run. In a weird way, what makes AI special is the very opposite of prediction. They're not brilliant at mixing and matching things that happen in the future. There's no data from the future. They're brilliant yeah. at mixing and matching the data from the past. That's one of the reasons actually why they're so good at like pastiche that's old fashioned. If you say, you know, write me uh, this weird story in the style of the King James Bible or in the style of Shakespeare, because those things are so old and there's so much data on them on the internet, they're fantastic at that. There's no data from the future. So it's not clear to me that this very technology would be so good at anticipating things that haven't happened. So to wrap up, the only things we know for sure is that this is an incredible way for students in high school and college to cheat. Like we, we just, this is like, this is it. This is the glory days of cheating. I don't think it's ever been a better time to cheat if you're a student. I don't even know how you police it. Um, if you're, I don't know, like if you're a professor, how would you, they must have some sort of devices, right? That can like check the rhythms of it at least. Yeah, they have tools as I understand it, but uh, Ian Bogus just wrote a piece about this for The Atlantic. The upshot of his piece was um, professors are screwed right now. Like this is the Napster era of cheating. Like for those like blessed, wow. whatever, like two and a half years, right? Where you could basically <laughs> listen to any song you wanted for free. It was just, you could just download it yeah. like that. And there was no way anyone was going to um, interfere. Th that is what it is right now for writing essays, especially essays about established history, established mathematics, established physics. Writing essays, I think about the future, it might be a little bit harder, again, because there's no information for the LLMs to gather about the future. But as I understand it, cheating is rampant. Um, and also, uh, you know, college professor letters of recommendation cheating might be rampant too. You know, the college professors might say, you know what, if none oh, of my wow. students are going to write authentic essays, I'm not going to write authentic letters of recommendation. And they could, of course, automate those as well. So I can imagine a lot of um, uh, cheating and cheating equivalent essaying uh, in high school and college. And the solution there is as obvious as it is inevitable. You have to test people in class. 
You have to have them write in class and you have to do oral examinations as well because if you send somebody home with a free technology that will 100% write that essay in a B plus style, you simply can't just, you know, say, all right, everyone just go home and put the essay question in a box uh, and get a B plus for me. I definitely would have used it. Yeah. And then the last thing to remember is just Netflix. This is going to be horror movies, rom-coms, high school teen comedies, you know, benevolent ones where somebody's in love with somebody else. The person doesn't realize it until the 20 minute mark left in the movie. Like we're just going to see a steady wave of, of just blueprint movies that will never end. So and it might be one stars. of these cases, and it might be one of these cases where the introduction of AI to screenwriting, and I say this cynically, but not because I hate screenwriters, just because I'm aware of what so much of uh, movies and television is, we might not notice it. We might realize yeah, no, years right. after the fact that Netflix might have been doing movies, it for five years. That all these movies that we've been watching, you know, while we had dinner or just sort of, you know, looked at our phones, that the stories were inflected by AI and we didn't miss a beat because they they retraced what audiences already wanted. Audiences already wanted a kind right. of efficient predictability that AIs turned out to be excellent at. Well, I talked to Spotify a week ago because Kyle had his bachelor party mm -hmm. and it was 50-50. He came back alive. So I was like, so if <laughs> Kyle doesn't come back, can can chat Kyle be the producer? And they're like, we're not ready yet. It's like six months away. So down the road, we might be able to play some. <laughs> 